Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, June 24th, 2022, on a Saturday. I'm getting back to my normal routine at last. <laughs> it's been a difficult week for a lot of us in uh, the U.S. I thought I might ramble about that a little bit uh, later in my outro, but for now, uh, let's get on to uh, the books that I read or am reading or hope to read uh, in this weekish of time. As always, I'll start with the next uh, story I read in this collection of short stories by Dorothy Parker. I have been reading one story in this collection per Am Reading video since last uh, May 2021, uh, and I am up to Soldiers of the Republic, which she published in 1938. I am sensing a significant shift of late in her stories, where her uh, social commentary is a lot less about dashed off, sarcastic asides about vapid people at parties, and now it's more about real events, or, you know, or events of far more sig social significance. Uh, and this one takes place in Valencia, uh, and it really chronicles uh, the Spanish Civil War, where her uh, character is uh, ruminating on the uh, soldier see she sees, these sort of uh, uh, everyday, down-to-earth sort of men talking about uh, some of uh, their thoughts and ruminations. And I think it's just supposed to be a bit uplifting about, you know, who they are and what they fight for. It is definitely a uh, pro-republic, anti-fascism sort of uh, feel. I mean, I don't think she gets really into the political didacticism as much, but she definitely in a very sort of more idealized way or, you know, or empathetic way than usual, without any sort of sarcasm, it seems, she really is taking the side of these people. So it's an interesting shift. Uh, I guess I'll be curious to see if uh, that's where uh, Parker continues to go as we move out of the 30s and into the 40s, where, you know, things are really going to heat up around the world once again with World War II. But moving more into the present day, the first book I finished this week was uh, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. This is a memoir that uh, chronicles an abusive uh, same-sex relationship she was in. It's more complicated than that. She obviously wanted to get into an emotional, like, viscera of what it was like, and not just linearly, this is what happened, and this is what happened, and this is what happens. Uh, so she has several different chapters. It is, I think, kind of gimmicky. This was a little outside of... Uh, I don't know, comfort zone isn't right, but it didn't completely work for me. Uh, all of her chapters are named, you know, dream house as, as uh, this genre or that genre or this idea or that idea. The dream house refers to uh, the house where her uh, lover lived. They were, you know, a long distance relationship, but, you know, she would go visit her lover. And this house sort of became like this uh, vessel of, uh, of abuse and victimization for her. This woman was largely psychologically abusive and just, you know, constantly belittling her and putting her down and having these screaming temper tantrums. And then, like, I think most uh, damning to psychological health is the gaslighting, where, you know, once she sees that Carmen is on shaky, you know, mental ground, then she'll turn it all off and say, what? Everything's fine. So, you know, it's that's, that's very dangerous to psychological health. But anyway, uh, so, yeah, that's the gist of uh, the relationship that she is... Um, chronicling where she goes into very specific little details of like these bad incidences that she and her uh, girlfriend have where her girlfriend is you know putting her through and then other chapters get more esoteric some are just like a dashed off sentence uh, of ideas or, or vagueness and that just doesn't work for me as much and then there were other chapters that did work for me certainly the backstory chapters where she talked about what it was like for her growing up and other sorts of relationships she had. And, you know, in a way, it feels sort of foreshadowing. Uh, and also she gets into um, dissecting pop culture and, and news events and that sort of thing. And that stuff worked better for me as well. Uh, and in general, uh, I guess I, I, by the end of it, I, I found what I needed, I guess, in, in terms of personal reading. This was a challenging book for me. Like, I didn't really want to look at it. And admit to violence in the queer community, especially in the lesbian community, especially during Pride Month. <laughs> Why'd I pick it this month? But I felt like it was good for me to do that. And, you know, she was, uh, you know, struggling with that as well. I think that was part of the reason why she stayed with this woman as long as she did, because it's like, if I admit that, you know, this woman is abusing me, it's like the homophobes are right and lesbianism is evil or something. I mean, it just gets into that sort of self-hate caked into societal homophobia. 
Uh, so, and that ultimately hurts everyone all around, you know? Uh, so I felt like it was, uh, you know, where she was interrogating what it is to be queer in a reality where there is queer abuse and that it has often been pushed under the table either by, you know, homophobic ideas about women can't be abusive in the terms of uh, female abusers or the idea of this self-hate of we can't, if we admit to anything being wrong, then it's like we're saying that, you know, the homophobes are right and how dangerous that is. And then all of the invisible victims and so forth. And, and then it gets into intersectionality about uh, people of color as well in some of the court cases uh, she looks into. So I, I felt like that was good for me. I challenged myself. She challenged herself about this reality of being queer in an imperfect world. Uh, so uh, I thought I really appreciated where that ended up. And I think she's just a strong writer. It's just sort of the gimmickiness of this uh, didn't quite work for me, but I am really glad she wrote it. And I think it's been helpful for her and hopefully for other readers. This next book I'm in the middle of, hopefully I'll be finishing soon, is Dancing Arabs by Saeed Kashua, which uh, was translated from the Hebrew by Miriam Schlesinger. I would have probably assumed that uh, Kashua had written in Arabic, uh, and I would have been mistaken. And it's interesting to look at, you know, this is a book about uh, uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian-Israeli citizens, you know, Palestinians living in Israel. And there's always the question of who is this book for? And I saw on Goodreads, like people saying, this is not a book for the Jews or something, as in, uh, you know, you can't judge, you know, these experiences. Although at the same time, it feels like uh, Kashua is trying to reach out to his community by using Hebrew, I suppose. Uh, I think that's interesting. Uh, this is, uh, I think, his first book that he wrote. It is the second book of his I've read. I actually uh, just uh, read through the first uh, few paragraphs of the first book of his I've read back in my Would You Read It Challenge video I did a couple weeks ago, I can link below. But this one is more autobiographical. Uh, it follows a young boy who grew up uh, in the Galilee in an Arab town uh, and his experiences, uh, he has, you know, family members who fought and died uh, in uh, 1948 against uh, the Israelis. Or, and then he, uh, he himself now lives in Israel uh, and, uh, you know, there's occasional nods to people trying to bridge divides and he joins uh, Seeds of Peace and there's some, you know, attempts to, you know, have uh, intercultural exchange between him and Jewish students. And then he ultimately even goes to a uh, sort of a Jewish magnet school for, for kids who are, uh, you know, who are gifted, I suppose it is. So he has a interesting experience and I think he, he goes into it in the form of vignettes a lot of the time. Uh, to, and I think that does uh, capture a lot of the satire of what it is uh, to live within between cultures, I should say. Uh, and like there's this satire about, you know, the cruelty of uh, Jewish treatment of Arabs and also uh, Arab treatment of Jews. Like there's like a lot, like some anti-Semitism in here, like his grandmother talking about, you know, Jews uh, baking blood in their matzah. So, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, coming over uh, from past history. So anyway, uh, I feel like the vignettes don't always work for me. They have, they, I don't know, they're so fleeting that I can't grasp onto character as much. But I wonder if the satire can be uh, useful. You know, actually, I'm, I'm reading this for my uh, synagogue's uh, Israel book club. And the last book we've read, which was actually from uh, chronicling an Israeli settlement in the occupied territories, a very different uh, but similar in a way, political area, but we were following predominantly uh, Jewish characters there. And the Jewish writer wrote about that satirically and then Kashua now is writing satirically as well. I wonder if this is our way of having a little distance uh, or I don't know, maybe we'll be reading different sorts of fiction uh, coming up, hopefully in coming months in my Israel book club. But uh, yeah, uh, I, there's a lot of interesting stuff to unpack here. There's a big theme. It was also in his other book about when you are a minority in, you know, a society that uh, tends to uh, have a homogeneous uh, element to it in terms of Israel being the Jewish state and uh, Jewish customs being, you know, very privileged. Uh, there is the idea of his character and the characters in his other books wanting to be Jewish sometimes, you know, not wanting to, you know, be the minority who, you know, does it, who doesn't feel like he belongs as well as much and wanting to be part of the majority of people who, you know, the state is made for. So that's definitely a challenging thing to come across, especially like as a Zionist, as somebody who, 
who sees the uh, positive aspects of having a space for Jews to call their own coming from so many areas of persecution and not being the dominant culture and, you know, either having to, you know, deal with uh, prejudice or assimilation or that sort of things to have a place where there's pride in Jewish customs. But, you know, there's a flip side to the fact that no nation is homogeneous. You know, there is no overarching, you know, culture for everybody. And I mean, that's something that I think uh, all nation states have to deal with uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about nationalism in this Israel Book Club. So yeah, that's uh, where I am with this right now. I will be meeting with the group uh, on Tuesday, so I'm very much hoping to have this book completed before then, and then I will be solidifying my thoughts. I am also in the middle of this book on audio. This is The Unwilling by Kelly Braffitt. It is the start of a fantasy duology series, a adult fantasy series. Fun fact, Kelly Braffitt is the daughter-in-law of Stephen King. Uh, and uh, I, in fact, read uh, one of her books uh, beforehand. It was a contemporary book. I didn't realize it until I started researching her that that was her book. But anyway, this is her foray into uh, fantasy. It's secondary world fantasy. And in fact, I am reading this book because uh, a couple of months ago, I played the BookTube Spin TBR game started by Rick McDonnell. And I put this book on my list and Rick spun that number. And so I picked it up. And uh, this is my disappointing book of the week, frankly, uh, maybe the month even. Uh, I was hoping that, you know, there was going to be, you know, family angst and intrigue and political stuff in a secondary world uh, fantasy setting, but uh, I feel like it isn't really coming together to me, uh, for me. It is largely titillation, I think, without any backing and world building, or not much of a backing and world building. So the whole idea is that we are taking, this story is taking place in this city-state, uh, and we're predominantly following this foundling around. Her name is Jude, and she's been uh, raised with, uh, I guess, the royal family, as it were, because uh, when uh, the uh, heir to uh, the city, uh, Gavin is born, the midwife happens to have her as this uh, foundling with a tragic past. And she was about to get rid of the foundling, like, you know, uh, throw her in the water or something. I mean, this world is incredibly uh, uh, violent for whatever reason. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the mother giving birth to Gavin decides, you know, she wants to she have another baby. She'd been trying so hard and I guess she, you know, felt bad for this foundling. So she raised the foundling with her son Gavin. And then what do you know, this magical connection blooms between the two of them where like whatever the other one is feeling or th uh, feeling physically, uh, is uh, trans uh, transposes onto the other one. So that basically when one gets hurt, the other gets hurt exactly the same way. And then of course this becomes very dangerous for the heir to a uh, city, you know, because if she, uh, you know, gets hurt or in any way, <laughs> he's in trouble. Uh, so they are raised together. The woman ends up dying. Their other people come along into this family, like uh, Gavin gets a betrothed and a younger brother. Uh, and they live in this just horrible hellscape with their evil, maniacal ruler dad person <laughs> uh, who is just completely sadistic for reasons I don't really understand. <laughs> uh, and then there's a secondary storyline that actually delves more into magic and fantasy stuff that I like but isn't as well developed where there is this uh, healer who sort of tricks his way into the city and he seems to know what happened to Judah, who is, you know, obviously the super special one. <laughs> uh, and has, you know, she has this mysterious past and there's magic around it and there's, you know, uh, you know, past grievances, cultural clashes and uh, curses and that sort of thing. And we're getting into that, I think I'm about three fourths of the way through or something. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I just, I'm struggling with this because I feel like so much isn't working. Like, first of all, Everyone is shocked all the time by how violent and brutal and awful everything is, even though we're also told all the time that it's normal for things to be this violent and brutal and awful. <laughs> so I'm not sure what they're shocked about. Uh, and it feels like everything that happens isn't so much for, you know, a purpose, but it's just, you know, to feed that angst about, oh, their situation is so horrible. And it's called character driven because there really isn't a lot of plot elements moving things forward. Like, why are things happening? <laughs> like, why is this uh, this 
king guy, like so brutal, a, you know, a warmonger. And who are these other people he's fighting anyway? Like what's their, you know, relationship to one another? Uh, and we don't get much into that, any of that at all. Besides the fact that obviously he's looking for someone to break this bond between his son and the foundling. And obviously that has to be done with violence, because why not? <laughs> I mean, I don't mind violence in world building. Like, you know, we have Game of Thrones, we have like, I don't know, Ava Reed just came out with her uh, next uh, fantasy novel, and her novels are known for being violent, but there's a point to them. We know why things are happening, and I just can't get over the fact that I think the reason horrible things are happening in this book is because Kelly Braffitt wants her characters to be in a state of angst and drama, and that's why it's happening. Admittance time. Sometimes I like that stuff. Sometimes I don't care about, you know, the actual, like, uh, interesting parts of story about, you know, having themes and messages and character development, and I just want to read angst to read angst. And in fact, I think that's why her, I read her uh, contemporary story, uh, which was then turned into a movie, so there's that. But it kind of has a similar element, I think, in that this brother and sister, they're isolated and everything is awful for them, and the majority of the reason why seems to be for, you know, titillation. <laughs> Uh, so, but then I don't admit to reading it. You won't find my review of that book on Goodreads, and I'm only admitting to it now because I thought this book would be more serious in a way, you know, uh, more contemplative about, you know, these issues and, and have, you know, more magic and things like that. <laughs> so that's where I am with this book. You know, sometimes I do like it because sometimes I like to be titillated as much as the next person. I mean, this is getting very pornographic, this review. But at the other time, I'm like, no, I want more of a story. I want reasons for why things are happening. I want, you know, some sense of uh, pathos and purpose, you know, beyond just, we have to be miserable just because, you know, <laughs> it's a melodrama of misery porn. <laughs> Uh, so basically, I'm sitting here, I kind of assumed I'd like the book, I was hoping I would, and that there's a sequel that just came out recently that I thought I would read next month, but now I'm trying to pull myself back and say, is it really worth it? Like, whatever enjoyment I get out of the titillation isn't really matching up to the fact that I'm annoyed by nothing else working, and there's so many other books for me to read that, uh, you know, maybe I should, you know, let that one go, and I'll have to rethink my TBR for July. We shall see. <laughs> And finally, next on my docket, hopefully I'll be reading all of this before the end of uh, June because I still have so much more I want to read, yada yada, but I have uh, Night at the Fiestas, which is a short story collection by Kirsten Valdez Quaid. I uh, just read uh, Quaid a few months ago for the Booktube Prize. Her uh, first novel was published last year. And so now, of course, I can pat myself on the back for my obligatory mention of the Booktube Prize in this video. <laughs> And then I decided I wanted to, uh, I decided just recently I wanted to pick up her collection of short stories, which was published a few years before, uh, because I was trying to prep for the mid-year book freakout tag that I'm hoping to do by the end of the month, and I'm hoping I can talk about this book and will really like it, so we shall see how it goes. Uh, one cool thing about this collection is that uh, one of the short stories in here is in fact the short story that she ultimately elongated into The Five Wounds, which was the novel she published last year. So it'll be intriguing to see how it started out and the differences and the sense of promise in uh, the short story that she published uh, earlier. So I'll be looking forward to giving my thoughts on that. Uh, I am thinking I might uh, do another AM reading video, uh, probably not uh, in June, but like an early one in July to wrap up this book, and hopefully some others that I will at least start before the end of the month, but oh man, we are getting near the end of the month here. <laughs> so that about covers it for me now. Yeah, like I was mentioning, it just feels like a, I can't get past uh, this week without mentioning that... Uh, um, on Friday, uh, the Supreme Court, unsurprisingly, given the leak, uh, overturned uh, Roe versus Wade, which was uh, the uh, ruling of the constitutional right uh, for women to, you know, uh, have health care to receive abortions if they wanted it. Uh, and uh, now that uh, constitutional right is no longer, and it is up to the states basically about if they will provide any or some, uh, you know, health care to uh, women. Uh, and it just got me thinking a bit about uh, 
A few things, really. Uh, I guess sometimes I feel like uh, the cultural stuff I'm consuming sort of leans into uh, political realities, like I've been watching and uh, consuming a lot about Obi-Wan Kenobi miniseries and the, and the prequels, which are a lot about how uh, our own, we destroy ourselves from within. <laughs> and I feel like in a lot of ways that's uh, what happened with the Supreme Court and how, you know, uh, the election of Donald Trump really was a destruction from within because his uh, admittance to uh, the presidential uh, seat made sure that uh, he could stack the Supreme Court with uh, justices who would make this happen. Uh, and I was also thinking about uh, the movie that I watched for my Maybe Midrash uh, readathon uh, wrap-up that I just uh, posted a couple days ago. Uh, the movie was called The Women's Balcony. It was an Israeli movie about uh, schisms in a community of uh, modern Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox, uh, where this ultra-Orthodox rabbi stepped into a void uh, when a synagogue uh, was in disrepair, and the community wanted to put their synagogue back together. And he had these ideas, uh, based on his interpretation of uh, scripture, about uh, what should happen when and who should be privileged. And it was at odds with uh, the wants and needs of the community, particularly when it came to the female members of the community. And that made me think a lot about Roe versus Wade and the Supreme Justices, because every time I hear about polls being taken of Americans who uh, want access to abortion rights, uh, the number is usually at least 70% of uh, the people who are polled. And granted, you know, polls can uh, sometimes be more questionable than they appear, you know, not be as accurate. But it still seems like, uh, and I see, because I've seen a lot of polls, that it's a significant number of Americans, more than half certainly, want the access to abortions. And yet it's like this, uh, this minority of people, particularly now with the Supreme Court justices, who are, you know, saying, well, too bad, and we're going to do things the way we want. And maybe they truly believe it, like the rabbi truly believes in his, his uh, interpretation of scripture about what's most important, and they truly believe that their interpretation of the Constitution and their morals, I suppose, about women's health care is what's most important. But they must know that they're going against popular opinion, what the community they serve really wants. And so I've just been thinking a lot about that. And so that's uh, where I am right now. And it is also a way for me to plug my Maybe Midrash uh, wrap-up video, which I know is, it's, it's a very long video, and it's about, you know, a very uh, specific Jewish uh, context of books and movies. But I figure I'll plug it anyway, because I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. And, you know, everyone needs a pick-me-up at the end of a difficult week. So I hope you are all doing okay as well at the end of uh, this week, especially to my fellow Americans, and I hope you are finding comfort and solace in reading and in activism and uh, whatever you need to do. Uh, and may uh, July be a better month, I hope. We shall see. But I will be back on this uh, channel within the next couple of days as I wrap up June to do a book haul video of the books I acquired this month. So more happiness abounds. Stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. And I'll see you next time.